Good afternoon, guys. Ah, there's still some energy left. Good. Good. Let's see. You'll have half an hour. How do you guys feel? So I'm a computational psychologist, which means that I'm studying people through the lenses of big data, of digital footprints that we are all leaving behind while using the internet, digital devices, and other digital platforms. Now it's a really good time to be me because, well, I'm here, first of all, but also because people are increasingly migrating to the digital environment. So we're abandoning traditional environments such as cities, marketplaces, even very often traditional interactions between people, and we are moving towards digital environments, digital marketplaces, digital social networks, digital entertainment uh, platforms. Uh, so instead of hanging out with our friends in person, we increasingly hang out with them uh, on Facebook or Twitter or in other places. And now some people I hear saying, oh, that's so sad. But on the other hand, it's actually, you know, empowering. Uh, it gives us access to many more connections. It uh, helps us to overcome geographical boundaries in access to social networks and knowledge and education and marketplaces. So actually on the level of humanity, I personally strongly believe it's a great thing that we are migrating to digital environment. Now, one of the great things from the point of view of a social scientist like me is that in, while going about our lives in the digital environment, we are leaving behind enormous amount of digital footprints. So Facebook will record your communication and social interactions with the others. In fact, Facebook would even record messages that you've never sent. You would just type a message and then you change your mind because you're drunk. <laughs> and guess what? The message is still recorded. Your phone records your geographical location, your communication with other people, but it also can record your physiological states. The accelerometer in your phone is uh, sensitive enough to be able to feel your heartbeat. And you don't even need to use the phone increasingly to do so, or the companies and psychologists do not have to use your phones to record this data because people are eagerly putting on those little devices like Fitbits that would explicitly record this kind of information. Who here in this room is wearing a Fitbit or other monitor at the moment? Exactly. Thank you, guys. You're generating all of this useful data for me. Uh, in fact, back in 2012, IBM, by the way, 2012 is like an era in the internet age, right? It's like five years ago. There was, you know, what was it, iPhone 2 or what? This is just very, very long time ago. Now, back in 2012, IBM estimated that an average person on this planet, and it includes people living in an Amazon jungle or too young or too old to even have a device. So an average person on the planet is generating 500 megabytes of data every single day. It's enormous amount of data. Now, how enormous it is, let me have a quiz here for you. So imagine, I didn't care about forests, and I wanted to print out one day worth of data that humanity is producing. Print it out on A4 paper, double-sided, font size 12, single line, with zeros and ones. It's probably not the most efficient way of doing that, but that's what I figured out. I'm only a psychologist. You have to forgive me that. So how tall would be the stack of paper? Any guesses? To the moon. OK. we have. To the moon, that's a lot of paper. Any other, any other guesses? Pardon? Around a globe. Actually, it's a bit shorter than to the moon, I feel, isn't it? I think so. No, in fact, it's like from the surface of the Earth to the sun four times over. And this is just one day worth of data. Now, amazing thing from the point of view of scientists, but also industry, and also you guys, is that this amount of data allows us to spot patterns that were invisible to scientists before we had so much data. If when I invite 20 people to the lab, or have a survey and give it maybe even to a few thousand 
people, I will not be able to spot intricate, complex, psychological, social, and health issues that can be very easily spotted when you have data from millions of people and you have 500 megabytes of data from each of those guys every day. So now I study, I try to study humans and try to spot patterns in their behavior, but one of the questions that you can also answer with such data is how much about an individual is being revealed in their digital footprints. Now, obviously, if you have listened to Lady Gaga 30 times yesterday, it easily reveals that you are weird, <laughs> but also it easily reveals, clearly reveals, what your music taste is, right? If you donated a lot of money to a given politician, or if you keep buying, uh, whatever, silver, silver spoons on eBay every day, it kind of shows those like simple facts about you. But now my research is about what else can we reveal from such data? What can we reveal that is not visible on the surface? And let me play you here a short video that uh, will tell you more about this line of my research. Now, clicking like on Facebook is something most of us do without thinking. The University of Cambridge over in London actually did a study of what people like on Facebook to try to determine uh, facts about them that they wouldn't otherwise know. So they didn't just look at the products, the, the movies, the bands that people like. They also looked at the status updates that people like, the photos that people liked. And they were able to draw some really, really interesting conclusions about all of your likes that you're clicking can tell more about you than you might have realized from your political values to your religion to your gender to your happiness to yeah. your age in fact some parts of your identity can be predicted with 95 percent accuracy accuracy was lowest about 60 percent when it came to predicting whether a user's parents were still together when they were 21 people whose parents divorced before they were 21 tended to like statements about relationships drug users were id'd with about 65 percent accuracy smokers with 73 percent and drinkers with 70 percent Sexual orientation was also easier to distinguish among men, 88% right there. For women, it was about 75%. Gender, by the way, race, religion, and political views were predicted with high accuracy as well. For instance, white versus black, 95%. The findings of alarmed privacy campaigners who fear this research could be used to commercially exploit users. So keep in mind that just because you think you're not revealing a lot of personal details on Facebook, you're still spreading the word to the outside world as well as those online marketers. Volunteers with few friends liked walking with your friend and randomly pushing them into someone or something. Hey, it's not their fault they don't have friends. Everyone they know keeps getting randomly pushed into traffic. High IQ corresponds to liking Mozart, science, and the Colbert Report. Research indicated people who like Harley Davidson motorbikes are generally of low IQ. We thought we'd better offer a right to reply. I'd say our average customer is probably more intelligent than most, and we've certainly got a lot of customers who are, well, people from Cambridge University for a start. A like on Facebook can reveal if you're a gay man. Yeah, especially if what you choose to like is penises. <laughs> That's my wife walking yes. in. I'm like, oh! <laughs> it's a joke. Okay. By the way, don't be an idiot and think that if somebody clicked on Wicked the Musical that they're gay automatically. Or they clicked on Harley Davidson and they're stupid automatically. Ironically, that would make you stupid. <laughs> so as you can see, simply by looking at your Facebook likes, a computer algorithm can tell a lot about you. It can reveal your political views, your religiosity, your sexual preferences, what drugs you're taking, your personality, intelligence, and a wide range of other psychological traits. Now, obviously, as has been said here in this video, just by liking Lady Gaga or just by liking Harley Davidson, you do not give out information that is conclusive. 
right? So if I just know about you, that you like Harley Davidson, well, actually, first of all, as a human being, I probably just know what your preference in bikes is. I can't really, as a human being, squeeze more information from it. Why? Because the connection between you driving, riding, sorry, uh, you can see that I don't have a Harley Davidson, riding on your Harley, it's not deterministic. It's not revealing that you are smart or stupid or gay or extrovert or introverted, but there is a small, tiny bit of information. Now, this tiny bit of information is too subtle for a human brain to detect. We are good at detecting like obvious pieces of signal. You talk about Obama a lot and talk about him in positive terms, I know what your political views are. You um, wearing a certain kind of a head cover, I know what your religion would be, right? But you listen to Lady Gaga, read a certain book for a human being, not a very informative piece of information. Now, computer algorithms are great at extracting little tiny patterns that for a human being are not visible, and then combining those little tiny pieces of information that on its own are not significant, combining it across hundreds or thousands or millions of digital footprints into a very accurate prediction, something that human being can't uh, really do. Now, the big question is, how accurate are such predictions? And we decided to test it on one type of a prediction, which is, in fact, pretty easy for human beings, which is personality. Humans are master personality predictors. Why? Because personality of other people is one of the most important facts for us as we go through our lives. Why? Because our environment is mostly composed of other people. You know, animals don't kill us, you know, are not a major threat for us for millennia now. Who is the major threat for us? Other people. Who is the major collaborator for us? Other people, right? We can overcome environments as difficult as, you know, far north Greenland. Why? Because our environment is mostly composed of other people and successful collaboration with them is key for our survival. This is why we are such good judges of character. It's enough that I see your face for a few seconds and my brain already has somewhat accurate information about whether I can trust you or not, whether you're aggressive or calm, whether you're extroverted or introverted. Now, this information won't be very accurate, but it will be there. Now, if I spend some time with you, I'm getting better and better at judging your personality and predicting your future behavior because it's so crucial for me. So now what we decided to do, we decided to compare the accuracy of a computer predicting human personality with an accuracy of a human predicting personality of other humans. So first, we build a model predicting personality from Facebook likes. And there are five personality traits that are usually looked at in psychology, openness, agreeableness, extroversion, conscientiousness, and neuroticism. They actually probably don't even need much introduction because they're pretty intuitive types of traits. So everyone knows what extroversion, introversion is. And now, we had computer predicted. And you can see that the more likes we reveal to a model, the better the prediction is, which makes sense because the more information the model has, the more accurate the prediction will be. Now, the question is, how does it compare with human accuracy? So what we have done, we took 40,000 people, and then we asked coworkers of these people to judge their personality. Now, to make it easier for them, we actually gave them questionnaires that they could fill in in the name of the target of the assessment. So let's say if we were working together and you were target of our study, we would measure your personality using a questionnaire, would predict your personality using Facebook likes, and then we would ask your coworkers to fill a personality questionnaire in your name, well, because they spend some time with you, so they presumably know you, so they can fill it accurately. Now, how many likes do you need to reveal to the computer model to be able to achieve the accuracy of a coworker? Any guesses? Come on, guys. Hundreds. 27, it's a great guess, so much accuracy. Well, in fact, it was 11. You need to reveal 11 likes to an algorithm to beat the accuracy of a coworker. Now, note one thing that coworker is not basing their judgments just on Facebook likes. In fact, 
if I showed you my Facebook likes, you wouldn't be able to judge my personality because human brain did not evolve to perform such tasks. But we are great at judging people based on our interaction. Now, to achieve accuracy of a friend or a family member, you need around 100, 110 likes. And to beat the most accurate of the human judges, your spouses, <laughs> you need about 240 <laughs> Facebook likes. Now, this is not much. Think about it for a second. An average young kid is probably liking you know, more than that in any given day. And also, Facebook likes are not the only type of digital footprint that is out there, that we are living out there. In fact, Facebook likes are probably the least revealing type of digital footprint. Why? Because they happen in a public space. So people are really good at not liking things that maybe would be embarrassing or maybe too intimate, right? You, you know that other people know what you like, so you kind of don't really like things that you wouldn't other people like to see. Now, when you're browsing the internet, in your pajamas at home, or you are searching the internet for the information on something. Now, kind of, you don't really feel like you're being observed, and also you very often don't have choice. You actually really need to know this piece of information or go to this website, and then you basically do it. And this type of digital footprint is even more revealing. So, one thing I should mention is that it's not anymore just something that scientists talk about. There are actually APIs out there. There are models out there that companies can just access, can, sh can take digital footprints of a user, send it to an API, and receive detailed psychodemographic profile of a given person predicted, inferred from these likes. And this is one of the examples. Cambridge University has this website called Apply Magic Sauce, and you can, actually it's a great demo as well. You can go there yourself, with your log in with your Facebook profile, and Cambridge University will tell you what psychodemographic profile you have based on your Facebook likes. People very often say, oh, it, mis it misjudged my gender. It thought, I was a, uh, it thought I was a woman, not a man, and it's just such a stupid program, such a stupid program. And I'm like, mate, look, it actually could just look at your gender because it's also out there. Not to mention you could look at your picture and predict your gender from there. It's just based on your Facebook likes. And now you let your husband like things for you, so now here you go. Uh, okay, but what other, what, other, uh, what other types of signal are useful? Language is one of the best predictors out there that we can use to infer intimate traits uh, of people. Uh, and in fact, again, there are APIs out there that enable you to utilize it for predictions. This is a screenshot from one of them, IBM Watson, where you can send samples of text and IBM Watson will give you back information about the psychographic profile of a given person. Now, websites visited. This information is way uh, slightly more difficult for companies to put their hands on, but there are also models and there's research showing that you can look at the history of websites that a given person visited and then extract their detailed uh, information. And finally, something that I'm excited the most about at the moment is our pictures of our faces. Now, when I bring it up during my talks that, hey, you know, what I'm doing now is trying to predict intimate traits of people just based on a picture of the face, usually the audience is like, ah, oh, this is stupid now, he's completely crazy. How can you predict anything about me, anything intimate about me, just looking at my face? Impossible. Now, but think about it for a second. We human beings are amazing at predicting quite a few intimate traits from human faces. It's just so obvious for us that we don't even notice. I'll give you an example. Gender. You look at someone's face, you immediately know the gender. It's an intimate trait. There's no obvious thing on a face revealing gender. In fact, try to think for a second what there on someone's face reveals the gender. Even as scientists, we don't fully understand yet what signals exactly human brain is utilizing to predict other people's gender. Okay, beard is kind of an obvious one, uh, but even if you show a cleanly shaven face, even if you show it for a fraction of a second, or even if you show just a little fragment of the face to a human being, human being will be able with very high accuracy to say this is a man or this is a woman. Also, there are other traits, <laughs> intimate traits, that we are great at predicting. Emotion. 
Emotion is an intimate trait. Yet humans have no problem judging emotion based on even still image of a human face. Even if a person wants to hide their emotion. That's interesting, right? That even if I don't want to show you my emotion, your brain still would be to pick up some pieces of information, maybe a redness on your cheeks, maybe some twitching of a, of a muscle here or there, and still will be able to infer the real emotion. Other intimate traits, gender I mentioned already, race is something that we can clearly see, but also even genetic information is visible on the face, which is very visible in terms of genetic disorders, right? With human brain, has no issue whatsoever to spot a large number of genetic and developmental disorders. Political views, <laughs> right? Pretty easy, very often. Now, so basically what happens is that humans can predict a broad range of psychological traits and intimate traits from human faces. Now, we are very bad at predicting other traits, like, okay, political views, in fact, we are, we are really bad at predicting political views of others just looking at their face. Now, but does that mean that there's no information on your face that reveals your political views? Not necessarily. Maybe it means that human brain did not evolve an ability or didn't learn throughout their person's lifetime how to infer political views from someone's face. And what we can do, we can train the algorithms, I will tell you uh, in a second about it, to basically try to achieve this task. And now let me give you an example here. So I mentioned before that people are good at predicting personality even just looking at someone's face. Now again, our accuracy is not really close to uh, algorithm accuracy, but we are better than random, just on a very short exposure to a human face. But what I've done here, I, I overlaid on top of each other 10 images, 10 images of an introverted woman, of introverted women, and 10 images of extroverted women. And when you do that, suddenly human brain has no trouble distinguishing between which one is which one. Whatsoever, the accuracy in this room would be 100%. Which of these women is extroverted? Exactly, it became so easy, why? Because by overlaying images on top of each other, we are amplifying those little giveaways that give out to an observer your personality in this case. Now, exactly like with Facebook likes, computer algorithms have an advantage over human brain that they can spot very tiny, subtle pieces of information and they can also combine it across many different pieces of information. So when we see other people's faces, we usually focus on some big giveaways. Now, when a computer looks at your face, it probably would take, well, not probably, but in fact, would take thousands of little data points, and each of those thousands of data points is only slightly revealing about your age, gender, political views, personality, sexual orientation, or whatever else we are looking at, and then combine it into a very accurate prediction. How do you teach computer to do it? Very easily, in fact, you just give a computer me thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of faces, and then you give a computer also thousands or millions of personality scores assigned to those faces, describing those faces. And now, after some time, a computer algorithm would basically learn how to distinguish one from another. And the accuracy, in fact, so this is just uh, some preliminary studies that I've been running predicting personality, so you can see some accuracy here, it's comparable with a coworker, basically. So just based on your face, computer can reveal your personality with the same accuracy as your coworker can. And this is the this is those are those, this is basically computer dreaming about introverts and extroverts. So this is kind of a stereotype of an introverted and extroverted female in computer's brain. And you can see that it kind of closely follows what's the stereotype probably in your brain of an introverted or extroverted person, which means. First of all, there is a grain of truth in the stereotype. And second of all, the computer algorithm has managed to accurately learn uh, this truth. Now, you can clearly see makeup for extroverts, no makeup for introverts, uh, dyed hair for extroverts, uh, presumably natural uh, hair for introverts. You can't really see it because the quality of the projector is not high enough, but there is a shade of the glasses on an introverted face. Whereas extroverts, again, you can't really see it, but the eyes 
are blue and green. Now, people, blue and green eyes are very rare in the population. So presumably, they're basically wearing uh, contact lenses. Now, there's another interesting phenomenon. It's better seen here that, look, introverts have nostrils, whereas extroverts have no nostrils. <laughs> Don't they ever breathe? OK, so what, what do you think is driving the lack of nostrils among extroverts? Any guesses? Why extroverts do not have nostrils on their pictures? Smile, angle of the photograph. I see we have some extroverted, experienced person. And of course, when you're an extrovert and you're taking a selfie, one thing that extroverts know how to do is to take selfies. Of course, you take it like this. And then you can't see any nostrils. <laughs> So if you want to spot an extrovert on the picture now, you know the secret. OK, and again, there, there are out there commercial services enabling you to tap into those models without having to train your own deep learning artificial intelligence network. For instance, Microsoft Cognitive Services, for now, they just uh, have tra uh, trained their models to reveal emotions. But it's just a question of time. Uh, when they will have uh, other intimate traits uh, uh, on offer. So let us talk for a few seconds or a few minutes about the consequences of this new ability that artificial intelligence has gained in recent years. An ability to take the data we are leaving behind, our digital footprints, and turn it into very intimate, basically reveal our intimate profiles our personality, our intelligence, political views, sexual orientation, uh, religious views, likelihood to take drugs, and potentially unlimited amount of other intimate variables that traditionally only we knew and our closest friends and family members would have access to, and not always. Right? For instance, political views. We all know they're our friends, and we all know who they vote for, but they would never admit it. Uh, because I don't know actually why. Maybe because maybe we're so awful and would bully them for that. Right? We all know there are people, let's say, who would never reveal their sexual orientation even to their own family members, right? And they're able to successfully hide this information today. But increasingly, as we, as we train our computers to become better and more accurate judges of human character, uh, we kind of losing this ability to keep this information private. Now, a few consequences. For, I will start with some consequences for the industry. Marketing is an obvious uh, industry that will benefit from understanding customer better. And obviously, it's not all bad. And it's not all privacy risks. Being able to match the match you with the products that you will enjoy, or talk uh, talk to you about the advantages of the product that you would care about is beneficial both for the companies who are selling the products, but also for the people who are buying those products. The same relates to convincing people to do things. When we could, if we could design better ways of influence young people not to smoke cigarettes, that's probably something that everyone in this room would agree is a great thing that we should be aiming at. If, on the other hand, we would use the same algorithms to try to, predict, try to influence people not to go to vote, now, again, everyone in this room would probably agree that this is a thing that we should not be doing with these algorithms, right? But I just want to say that you shouldn't be overly enthusiastic, but also you shouldn't be overly uh, uh, dramatic about uh, the changes that those algorithms are bringing to the society. And this is just a little plot showing you that if you match the character of an advert with a character of a person, your conversions and clicks would increase, sometimes by a factor of nearly two, which makes a lot of sense, right? If you know a person intimately, you know the traits, you would find it way easier to convince them to do something, go with you out to a party or buy something, or you would know that it's not even worth bothering because this person is so stubborn that you would never convince them to do whatever you want to convince them to, to do. Now, basically, now computers have the same ability. 
And few examples uh, of unfortunate, perhaps, use of, uh, of basically this technology uh, came in 2016 election when some of the political candidates were using uh, digitally derived intimate profiles of people to discourage them uh, from voting. Now, another area of life or large market or a, a type of industry that will be heavily changed by this new ability that computer, uh, computers got is the job markets, recruitment companies, recruitment and selection uh, companies. Nowadays, when you recruit new employees or when you guys are looking for a job, it's all happening roughly in the same way as it used to be happening in the medieval times, right? There is a company that is looking for employees that would nail the job offer somewhere on the side of their mill or maybe put it on monster.org, what is it, monster.com, monster.net, this big website online where people put their job offers. Then thousands of people would apply and then they would go through this painful and slow recruitment process involving interviews and questionnaires and tests and so on. Now, if you could with few clicks, enable people to test a broad range of the psychological traits. You could imagine a new job market where you have thousands or millions or tens of millions of people and their psychological traits and skills and strengths and weaknesses are known to the platform. And on the same platform, you could imagine all of the jobs and then a recommender system would basically match a person with a job that best fits her or his uh, goals or skills or motivations and so on. Now we've seen that happen for other markets like entertainment markets. No one goes anymore to a librarian to ask, hey librarian, which book would I enjoy reading, right? You go to Kindle, Amazon or Amazon website, and Amazon looks at the books that you've read before and recommends you the next best book that you'll find really interesting. And it's great. Because no librarian ever could know you as well as Amazon knows you. <laughs> and also no librarian ever could know as many books and as many other people as Amazon can know. So those recommendations got way more accurate, which opened us to all of those books that otherwise would have never had a chance to even learn about. Now, why wouldn't we do the same for jobs one day? And I hope this uh, one day will, it will happen. But another outcome of computers being able to infer intimate traits of people is the end of privacy. We are leaving increasing amount of digital footprints behind as we uh, use digital products and devices. Computers are getting better at turning those digital footprints into very accurate predictions of our intimate traits, which means that going forward in the future, there will be no privacy left for us individuals, but also for the companies. Right? We can talk about privacy both on an individual level, but also on the organization level. Now, many people say, oh, yeah, of course, but what if we could control our data and make sure that no companies or no institutions ever can access my private data? Guess what? Governments are trying to do the same thing. They try to prevent others from looking at their data. And guess what? It's impossible, right? Moreover, even if you somehow magically got an ability to control your data fully, there's probably still a lot of data that you want to put out there. You want to put your Facebook profile out there, maybe your blog, maybe your website, maybe your Twitter account, maybe a recording of your conversation, an interview, you would like to be out there. Or you would like to walk around with your face uncovered. And I just showed you guys a few minutes ago that just from the face, you can already reveal a lot of intimate traits using a computer algorithm. So basically what I'm arguing is that going forward, there's going to be no privacy. And now in this room, it sounds like, yeah, maybe a bit of creepy marketing and so on. But think about it for a second. On a global scale, it means a huge change to how societies operate within the society, but also what are the relationships between societies. Think about being a gay person in Saudi Arabia, where being homosexual is punished with death penalty. Or think about being an atheist in Saudi Arabia, where the same you get basically the same treatment there if you're an atheist. Now, an issue of privacy 
is really an issue of or life, of life or death, not just some creepy marketing uh, that you may uh, get. And I was mentioning to you how computers can predict personality from faces. Look at those two faces of those two, this computer dreaming of two males. What trait are we seeing here? Any guesses? <clears throat> we see sexual orientation. And computer can predict male sexual orientation with 92% accuracy based on five still images of their face. And this is a model that I trained on my laptop. If you train this, if you take you know, a building full of computer vision specialists and uh, their powerful computers, the accuracy would be most uh, likely even higher. So basically my takeaway message for today is the following. We all like to talk, including me, about all of those new shiny technologies in the future that will help us to protect our privacy. We all like to talk about putting pressure on politicians to enact laws that will give us back our privacy and take it away from the corporations. But guys, this is just a distraction. It's a bit like talking about making tornadoes illegal and giving people an individual right to opt out from being hit by a tornado. I'm all for it. I, I'm for it. I, don't, I want to make tornadoes illegal tomorrow, today even. The problem is that it will not stop them from coming. And it's the same with privacy. We have to start talking today about who, how to handle the post-privacy world, uh, the tornado of the post-privacy uh, world. Thank you very much.